mode. Okay, so in the chat room, I posted a link to Deep Note where I have um, notebooks set up. So let me share my screen. Now I'll see if I can find it. There it is. So what you're seeing now is in Deep Notes. Um, and if you follow the link that I posted, then you can follow along there. Or if you want to do it yourself, you can grab one of these notebooks over here to the left. And they're just empty notebooks. And you can actually run it and do it yourself along at the same time. Um, so for this, you can just copy and paste it. I've already imported the um, packages. So NetworkX and Matplot library are already imported. So if you, just for future notice, this requirements document, this is where you add things that every time a notebook starts that you want to load, which packages. So that's where I loaded the packages when I set up um, the site. Um, so I import both of those and um, those are the two packages we'll be using for this short tutorial. Uh, and I should say too that this is on the library's Python site, this whole tutorial, um, along with the links for where we got the ideas to put into it. So a lot of this is um, not my own work or someone else's. A lot of it comes from data camp and other places. But it'll give a good idea for those who are new to um, network analysis and um, how the basics are done of it. So the first thing I did was I just put in a couple of data points so that we would have something to work with. And this is done in what's called a symmetric um, network. So there's some assumptions that come with a symmetric network. And we'll do an asymmetric version as well. Um, but with the symmetric network, it pretty much assumes that if an arrow goes one way, then it goes the other way as well. So in this case, I just put in, let's say, actors. Um, and this is just conceptually, actor A was in a movie with actor C. And it's symmetric because therefore then actor C was also automatically in the movie with actor A because they were together. Now, if it was asymmetric, then it might be a different type of relationship. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but this would just give us some um, data to work with. So again, if you want to do it in your own notebook, you can just copy and paste that whole cell into your notebook. And then you have something to play with at the same time. Um, but now what we want to do is we want to start to map that network. Um, so in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to first uh, call the map plot library. And we're going to do it. We're just going to run it here in this cell. So that's the inline. And then we're going to do the NX, because we're going to call the network X. And we're going to have it draw network X. And we're going to have it just draw what we just created, which was the graph. Metric. And if I typed everything correctly, oh, I must not have uh, matplot library in line and x draw underscore network x. Uh, did I misspell something? Ryan, I'm not sure if you ran the cell above it, so it might not know what GC oh, network is. Oh, that's true. Maybe I, when I restarted, maybe I didn't run. Let's make sure I've run everything. Uh, you're probably right. Yep, perfect. So this is just a simple graph showing each of the actors and who they've been with in movies. 
and then as you can see, I can, um, I put in a couple of extra that weren't running. The little pound sign took them out for the time being. But if I add that back in and I run it again, and then run this cell again. Now we have a slightly different graph because we've added another relationship between C and D. Um, so in network analysis language, each of the dots they refer to as a node. So you'll hear people talk about the nodes and then the edges are the lines that run between the people. So what we've done is essentially we've created a bunch of nodes and we've told it to create an edge that runs between it. So that's why it says add edge. And then it tells it the two nodes that add the edge in between. And so all you're doing is you're basically drawing the graph then to be able to see what that looks like. So again, we can add the remaining ones in. And now when we run it, we see the fully formed network of these actors who have been in movies with these other actors. Um, and none of this is real data, of course. So these are just, could be anything at this point. Actors just gave us something to work with. Um, so now we can also do this as an asymmetric which is where things tend to get more interested. So for example, if we want to know if someone, if an actor has seen another actor's movie, this could be asymmetric then because actor A may have seen actor C's movie, but instead of saying that they're symmetric and therefore always the same, actor C may not have seen actor A's movie so therefore, there should be a line going in one direction to the other, and rather than going in both directions. Um, so what we could do is maybe it's, we'll take this and we'll add it into another cell. And instead of typing it off over again, I'm just going to grab some of the code. And we want to do an asymmetric, so I'll just add A's in. And this time, instead of just using regular graph, we're then going to use the DI graph, which gives the asymmetrical graph. And then we should be able to run this again. And then we want to draw the graph. So that just created the graph. And now if we actually want to draw the graph, again, we have to call the NX draw. And we're going to do the network X. And then we're going to do the graph. And this time, we're going to do the graph asymmetric instead of symmetric. And we'll run it. And now you can see what we've done is we've added arrows. So A here, who, as you can see, ends up in all of my relationships because I chose the first four cells, has seen the movies of actors B, C, D, and E. But the actor B doesn't have an arrow going back to A because actor B has not seen actor A's movie. But if we want to add that, we can just go back up we can, we can have it so that actor B has seen actor A's movie. Oh, did I add? Added too many. There we go. Run the cell, run the next one. And now we see that. Well, you can barely see it, but we have double arrows going back and forth between actors B and A, indicating that they have each seen each other's movies. So since I'm sharing screen, by the way, I can't see if you have questions in the comments area in the chat room. Um, 
But if you you can talk, if you can turn your microphone on if you have questions, I might be able to answer them. Again, I don't do a lot of network analysis, so um, that's why this is just a very basic introduction to give you an idea of what can be done. You can also change the layout some because as we're seeing here, it's rather crowded and um, packed in there. And NX has a library for that. Um, or a, so it's, you can do a spring layout. I'll just copy. And I wanna do the spring layout for that. And so then I have to draw it again. Um, so instead of the first layout, I'm just changing it to a new layout and then redrawing it. And I should be able to. And it spreads it out a little bit further. So now we can see, well, under the B is an arrow pointing in and then under the A for actor, it's pointing out the other side. You could take the labels off if you wanted to see it or you could move labels. But um, the important part is with the asymmetrical, we can have differing relationships. So one thing can have a relationship going one direction or it could go in two directions, which turns out to be quite useful, probably more useful than the symmetric. Um, though at times symmetric is it just makes sense. Just like if the actor is in with one, then they're, the other person is automatically in with them as well. So it just depends on the type of data that you're playing with, whether or not you want to use the symmetric or the asymmetric. Another nice thing that you can do um, is you can add weightings to these to show what is the strength of the relationship going in different directions. So for example, if we're still thinking about actors, um, we could add weightings, to, for instance, how many times or how many of their movies did they see? It's so like, how many of actors E, how many did actor A see? So let's say actor E is Brad Pitt, and actor A is some new actor, have they seen five of Brad Pitt's movies? Then we would weight that as a five, whereas maybe they've only seen two movies of a different actor. And so therefore that line would have a different weighting applied to it. So what we can do then is we can actually add those in. And so we would use, we create a variable called G weighted and we would use the graph pulling that out. And then we have to create the weighted pieces for the weights for each of them, for each of the edges. So we add to it an edge we would do actor A, let's say to actor C, and then we had add the weight to that edge. And I think I had said five, so we'll give it a weight of five. Now we can just take that same piece of code And we can do a whole bunch of them. So we can do the C to D to E to B. Let's do this one, let's say from C to D. And we can change the weights on those. So we'll just make up some weights. And the weights, of course, can be a, a point, so a half or a fourth. Or, um, so we can add some weights to those. And then we run it. Oh, oh 
I see. I put an underscore up here instead of a period because I'm running. OK, so now we have a new data set. And we have, again, the actors. And this time, we have the weights. And so again, I want to run a different, um, I want to spread them out a little bit. So I'm going to do a circular layout, just to show you what a different layout looks like. And we're going to do it on G weighted, if I could spell. So we change to a different layout in it again. Um, we're going to make our edges and then be equal to the G weighted edges. And then we're going to have to tell it what weights we want it to use. Um, and so to do that, we just have to go in and tell it which part. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll cut and paste this in instead of typing, because my typing skills are pretty horrible, it seems, today. So I'll just tape it. So I'm just saying we're going to get it, and we're going to pull in the weight values for each of those edges. Um, and the U and the B are just the actor one versus actor two. And that's who's getting the weighted. And then we draw it again. X. And this time, it's the G weighted. And we want the lines, the width, to be equivalent to the weights. So I'm just telling it to make the lines wider if it's a stronger relationship. And if I got it all right, there we go. So now you can see through the lines which have the stronger relationships. So if we look back at our data, we can see that from actor A to actor C was a five, which is a fairly strong weight. But actor A to actor D over here um, is an even stronger. This is that eight weight. So it's an even thicker line, whereas A and E and B and C are all ones. And then this very thin line is the C to D actors weights. So you can start to visually represent what those edges look like. Now, of course, your weights could be whatever makes sense for the data that you're working with. Um, so if you're working with I don't know, whatever type of data, let's say you've done something related to relationships of different entities and maybe their businesses and you're looking at how much business they do with each other. So company A versus company C, then how much business could then be weighted to um, some element to illustrate what are those relationships they have. So you can do lots of different types of things depending on what data you're using. But it does give a nice visual representation of um, what it looks like. Now, of course, we can also change the layout again if we want, if we want to go to that spring layout. And I'm sure at this point, um, John can jump in and say, well, if you bring it into R, you can do something even better with the visualizations. Um, but no, that's too tricky. <laughs> it's not really my, I don't, I don't do this. I know there are great R libraries for that, but most of the network people I know are actually Python people. So there's probably a reason for that. Yeah. Um, well, now with your new tool, though, you can combine your R and your Python and just do the presentation part in R once you had the values and stuff. This is so. true. You could actually run all of that Python code from R. 
and then display it in like an R Markdown document or something. Lots of fun things to do <laughs> merging these things. Yeah, so there's lots of different ways that you could potentially use this. Um, and then you can keep playing with it. Of course, you can change the colors of the lines and all of that. Um, so we have this data that we have, and we can do additional things now. So we um, another thing we might want to do is we might want to look at the degree that a relationship is from one actor to another actor. Um, and so what we would look at then is we would want to look at how they relate in relationship to how they relate to other actors or what is the degree of that relationship. Um, in, it has a tool for doing that. Um, it's called degree, very aptly named. So if we went back and we took, let's just say our symmetric data, again, having typing issues, um, and we wanted to see for actor A, we can run that and it'll give us a value. Oh, why did it not give me a value? Oh, I just said actor, not actor A, that's fine. So it gives us a value of four, um, And then you could also do the same for the asymmetric. We just put in the A, we could run it. And it gives us a value of five. Um, so that should be telling us, but why is it five? I thought it would be four because it's telling us how many relationships they're in. Oh, it must be giving us five because of the weightings of those relationships and that asymmetric. Um, so that would start to help us though to understand how does one person stack up against another in terms of how many, for example, other actors have they worked with or have they seen the movies of. You can also then start to do um, things like what they call clustering coefficients. So um, it starts to show you how related people are to clusters. Um, so you can see like how tightly grouped different people are. We have a small data set, so you're not gonna be able to see too much with this. Um, but for example, if we did NX, clustering, um, and let's use our symmetric data again. Symmetric, and we'll just use actor A again. Much like that. And it'll give us a value to show um, kind of how well connected they are to the others. And if we look back at our data set from the symmetric, um, A is over here and is connected to four of them. So they're a fairly important person in the cluster and they get um, a 0.66. So you can also find out like what the mean cluster is um, or the average clustering, and then average clustering. And then you just do it for the whole rather than for, let's do it for the asymmetric this time. And it will give you a value. Oh, let's do it for the, there we go. So you can start to get values to how tightly clustered um, people are in relation to the overall for the entire group as well. Um, 
if we have um, a bigger data set, you could also look at what are paths. Um, and so as your data set grows, you may want to see, for example, what is the distance from one person to another person? So if actor A has not worked with actor D, how long is their path until they get to someone that has worked with actor D? Uh, this part of it always kind of reminds me of the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, if we're thinking about actors. Like how many degrees is, um, I don't know, another actor, some other actor um, from having worked with Kevin Bacon if they haven't worked with them directly. And they might be, they may have worked with, um, I don't know. I don't watch enough movies, I guess. I don't know enough actors. So they may have worked with Brad Pitt and Brad Pitt has worked with Kevin Bacon. So their distance would be two. Um, and we can do the same type of thing. We can find, for example, what is the shortest path within the weighted, we'll look at the weighted set this time. And we wanna know it from actor B um, going to um, Actually, let me look back and see. Do I have? I just have to see who. We'll do actor D, I guess. They should be far enough away. I just want to make sure it wasn't there and give us back a one. But So from actor B, it goes through actor A, and then they get to actor D. Um, so that's the path that it would take. If you want to see, if you want to put a numeric value, then you could do the shortest path, and then you just take the length of that path. And if we put the path on, now this should say two. Yep, two. So now you can start to see what is that social distance. Um, so in this case, I guess Brad Pitt worked with someone else who worked with D, who is Kevin Bacon. So though actually. Brad Pitt, I think, has been in a movie with Kevin Bacon. So they would have a distance of one. But you get the idea. Um, so from there, you can get into all kinds of interesting things. Um, you can do what they call uh, network trees, where you use that distance then. And um, you look to see what are the best ways to move through the tree. So if you want to get from one person to the next, what are the different ways that you could do and how do those relate to one another? Because often there are multiple paths that could be taken. Um, and it's not always distance that you're looking at because you want to put those weighted factors in. Um, so maybe the person that is that middle link has worked many times with Kevin Bacon and therefore you can go through them more easily than going through someone else who is only a stunt double for Kevin Bacon one time or something like that. So you can actually then use the weightings and look through the tree to see which is the best path using those weightings as kind of providing the resistance or the lubrication for going one path over another. Um, I don't think we'll do that. Um, I think we'll wrap up here in just a minute. But you can also do what they call network influencers. So you can see, for example, if you were doing this with Twitter data, you might want to see 
which people on Twitter are more influential on with other people on Twitter on some variables. Um, and you could do that within network X as well, as well as what they call centrality. So you can put in someone and see how central are they um, to the network. I guess I'll do that one. That's a quick one to do. So you can do degree centrality and we'll use the weighted So as you can see, actor A is um, very central to the network. C and D are in, whereas E and B are fairly weak to the central part of the network. So if you're thinking of like a clustering, A, C, and D are all in the inner parts of the cluster, and E and B are kind of towards the outskirts of that cluster. Brian? Yep. Um, you mentioned that you can't see the chat, so I just wanted to highlight that there is a question from Sudhir in the chat about um, how do we import these data sets for analysis? Say you want to find out how popular a company hashtag is on Twitter, like hashtag Apple. Yeah, so for this, I've just put in a data set up here at the beginning, um, but you could bring in any data set that you had. Um, so you would just open it as a file, you would have to make sure that your file is in an order that you can add it in. So like if you're going to add edges, you would have to tell it which parts of the file to bring in and to create all these edges from. So if you had it in a JSON format, you could just parse it. And then for here, you might have, for example, let's say that this was, um, was just a dictionary, you might bring in like the first element of actor A from your JSON file and so forth. So you would just parse, you'd bring in your JSON file, you would open it, then you would parse it into this type of a format, and then it would be ready to roll from there. Um, for this though, we just created a quick set of actors and created edges between those actors. And if you want to play with any of this, I'll leave it up um, here in Deep Note, and you can go in, and that same link will work. So, and I also in this folder here, you can see um, Garrett's demo on NLP last week, his regular expressions, and then the one we forgot to record that mine on AWS. And I'll do that one again so we can get it recorded are all here as well. So if you ever want to go back in and play with any of these, all I ask is don't edit the actual demo, but copy it and then put it into one of these blank notebooks um, and edit it there. I'm sure Garrett and I have our stuff on GitHub anyway, but it's just better practice not to mess with the original demo. Um, I guess actually I'll rename it, put it in. So that's a quick tutorial. Um, just to give you an idea of the types of things you can do pretty easily with Python and doing just some network analysis. Um, it does get more complicated as you get bigger networks and you have more things that you're looking for and multiple edges. But this gives you an idea of some of the basics that you could do with a small data set pretty easily. And then go ahead and stop sharing, I guess. There we go. Ah, now I can see the chat room again. So I have a, two screens going and whenever I go to one to the other, then I can't see the chat, so. Have you done any network analysis, Laura? Um, not much. Um, I know people use it a lot with social media data. And so um, 
with social feed manager, we have an export format that will export an edge list that you could then use to import into say Gephi or something. Yep. Um, but uh, I, network X looks great. I'd love to play with that. Is that kind of um, from your experience, the go-to library in Python for doing this sort of analysis? Um, it seems to be. I think it's definitely one of the easier ones to pick up. I think that if you get more advanced, then there's probably more advanced libraries to use. Um, but for doing pretty quick things, it seems. It's kind of like Garrett's presentation last week. Spacey is really good for a quick NLP. If you're really getting into NLP, then you're probably then a move into a TensorFlow or PyTorch or something like that. Um, but if you're just looking to do some basic things, I'd say Network X does all the basic things that you would want to do. Um, yeah, and if anyone wants to get into it, um, I know a guy out at Berkeley who's really into network analysis, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk with anyone. He looks at um, conspiracy theories and how they spread over the internet, which is really interesting to see like how people spread their <laughs> conspiracy theories. <laughs> they have a very distinct pattern of spread. Um, so. I have a question for um, Polly and Sudhir. If you've if you've ever used it in the context of your coursework or for any other projects, this tool or some other tool. Okay, so you're doing an NLP project on propaganda. That would be interesting. And then, yes, dear. Um, yeah, what I find is, again, I'm, a, I'm more of a hack at most of this stuff. I just like to play with it. So I get curious about a question like, oh, can I do it? And then it's about finding some tools. So I'd play around with it, even if it's not part of your data science courses. It's good just to know a little bit so that you feel comfortable when the time comes that you have the base understanding. Um, yeah, in my research lab meeting this morning, uh, we were talking about NLP. And we don't have any NLP projects going, but we were talking about different things we're playing with just to get ready for when we do have one. Because if you have a little background knowledge, you can get up to speed a lot faster than if you haven't played at all with it. So we're looking at some what they call transformers in NLP, which is a new way of doing NLP. Uh, we don't have any projects to use it, but it's good to pick it up early. Uh, continuous diagnostics and mitigation or cybersecurity. Oh yeah, I imagine that you have a lot of data that you're working with. <laughs> so. Okay, well, we have about eight minutes or so left for GW coders this week. Um, does anyone have things they wanna talk about, things that they're working with? If anyone wants to present, um, though, John, Garrett, and I have been doing a lot of the presenting. Anyone's welcome, and it doesn't have to be something that you know that much about. Uh, just like I don't know that much about network analysis, but I know enough to play around with it. Um, so if you have anything. Yeah, for the web scraping, I have a student who's doing it for her research, but she meets with her advisors at 11 on Fridays. So she'll present in the spring um, and she does her web scraping in R, um, but we could do one on how to do it in Python too. It's pretty straightforward to do with beautiful soup and a request. Um, 
Yeah, I was looking at um, for the for the workshop for the spring um, using requests HTML. It's a slightly newer library for doing some web scraping. But I'm, I'm going to explore that first. If I get something in kind of like a preliminary stage to share with folks, I can bring it here too. Yeah, and if you want to do easy web scraping, um, I've just been doing it in Google Sheets. And it does a really nice job. And it can do HTML, XML, JSON files. And it just automatically populates a Google Sheet with the data for you. Yeah, I think there's a web scraping is a very broad category. Yeah. <laughs> there's many versions of it. And I, I actually kind of, I, when I talk about it with people, I distinguish between like um, sites that have the data you need embedded in the HTML versus not. I like sites that have JavaScript that when you click on the site, it has to render in a browser and only then will the stuff actually show up. So like things like requests won't work for those types of sites. Um, you have to render it in a browser and then pull the, the, the code from the browser. And so that's like a whole different animal. Um, and that's where you want to use something like Selenium to sort of remote control Chrome. Um, so there's, there's probably, you know, five or six webinars on scraping, <laughs> depending on how yeah. the site is that you're using. And also just general strategies of like parse, parsing the data from the HTML is really its own task. And, and generally my strategy I often use is to locally save files first. I, I go gather all my files from the pages. I just save the full HTML file somewhere. And then I use a parser later to parse through those things because getting it from the website is the oftentimes the tricky part. Anyway. Yeah, what I find too is you have to know enough HTML to know how to parse it. If you don't yeah. understand HTML structures, it's hard to know what to look for. It's gonna bring you back something that's useful. Yeah. Um, you have to go through a lot of iterations of missteps if you don't know like how HTML, how tables can be embedded in tables and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's a deep topic. Um. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's sit here. I don't think we'll probably get into deep web. <laughs> we don't wanna end up getting into things that we don't wanna get into, but it is an important topic for those who do. Um, and I have no idea. I've never done anything with deep web in terms, but I'm sure it's hard to scrape because it's automatically off the web, so by its nature. But yeah, we could do one on just Selenium. Um, though I'm yeah. far from an expert in it, we'd have to find someone who's done more with it. I know Jasmine, our, my grad student, she did some with it, but it was hard. Um, oh, deep web is any site you need to log in. I've never heard. Oh, ah, okay. Term. So different than dark. I thought you were talking about the dark web where you don't want to go. Um, yeah. Logins you can also handle with Selenium. That's that's pretty much it. Like if if I don't have data that's immediately available in an embedded web page, then I just immediately open up Selenium and I, I just go there as my go-to because it's 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 really powerful and um, not too hard. And I think actually both the R and Python interfaces to it are very, very similar. Um, doesn't I haven't had too much trouble with either of them in terms of just like remote controlling the, the browser. So um, it's it's probably its own thing, but but especially if you're doing logins, that's first thing to go to. Oh, if you've done it, Polly, maybe you can give the coders thing on it. So you don't have to be an expert. Yeah, so. <laughs> you can just show us how you hacked into it. And uh, I, I've never taken a class on Selenium. I just Googled Stack Overflow until I figured it out, so. Yeah, yeah, that's why I don't like to show my code is most of my code is a nightmare too. Um, so. uh, yeah.
Okay. Well, we can go ahead and wrap it up for this week and we'll be back next week with a topic to be determined. Um, so we will figure out what we're gonna present. So I'm gonna turn the recording off now.